So today we're talking about schools that serve some of the most needy and challenging uh, students. And here to discuss what her work is, is uh, special education expert Jody Miller. Uh, you're the head of EBC Schools for the Children's Health Council. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay. Um, so the topic of special education, um, very diverse. I know there's, there's students who have autism, there's students with emotional disturbances, mm -hmm. health challenges. Uh, so we just thought we would dive into um, that world and understand what non-public schools are and mm -hmm. how they're they're meeting the needs and helping kids to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious what your background is sure. um, and, and what, what drew you to this field. Sure. Um, well, I started working as a PE teacher and health teacher for kids with intellectual uh, differences. Mm -hmm. I did that for about two years and um, really wanted to kind of support my staff, support staff more. So I went into administration and became an assistant principal, a principal, um, and then a director of a center for kids with autism. Mm. Um, really wanted to move at that point, so I moved to California from Tennessee and uh, worked in Big leap. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, worked in applied behavior analysis for a couple of years, three or four years, um, primarily also with kids with autism. What um, is applied behavior analysis? So applied behavior analysis is a research-based method um, to help build skills for kids that are not you know, developing those naturally. Um, and the research is done specifically, the past research has done, uh, been done with specifically with kids with autism, mm -hmm. um, ages um, up to five, so in that category. But um, kids at all ages are now being um, uh, provided that service. Um, it is uh, provided through insurance. Now it's required to be provided through an insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, the better part of my career, I've worked with kids with autism and then in 2010, um, transitions over to uh, over to EBC School, mm -hmm. where I managed their behavior program. Um, did a lot of development of systems in that in that program, and um, really broadened um, kind of my reach to um, um, so, uh, working with different types of kids with different types of challenges. Um, so at Esther B. Clark, I um, work with kids with emotional disturbance. Um, as an eligibility, but not, you know, the diagnoses are, are much different. So, mm -hmm. like you said before, anxiety and depression, um, mood dysregulation, um, and have been there for 10 years almost, um, and um, moved into more of an administrative role over those 10 years, and now um, the head of schools for both of our campuses. Mm -hmm. um, and and are uh, the school days at non-public schools similar to uh, what people would expect by sending their kid to a, a public school? I mean, they're there from 8 to, eight to 3? Yeah, or yeah all totally. Uh, very similar uh, arri arrival at 8 a.m., a dismissal at 2.35, mm -hmm. minimum day on Wednesday. <laughs> um, so, um, and we have, you know, uh, the state requires us to meet a certain number of minutes as okay. any other public school. So we have the same um, requirements as all, all public schools in the, in the state of California. Yeah. yeah, could you explain a little bit just how non-public schools are regulated? Because I think that's something that comes up for people who don't understand sort of how what their relationship is like to public yeah. schools and where they fit into that whole system. Yeah, so it's a, it's a funny phrase, right, non-public? Yeah. Um, and that <laughs> defines it by what is yeah. not. <laughs> I think it get, people get caught up on that. But um, we are a public entity. We mm -hmm. um, receive public funding. Um, it's just shifted from, you know, the, the state to, to the school public school systems to us. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of that continuum. Mm -hmm. um, we are regulated by the Department of Education, the Cal California Department of Education, just the same as any other um, school. Um, we have frequent checks um, from that department. Um, we do a three-year cycle where they're actually on site. They come in and check basically everything about our school from curriculum to first aid kits um, to our behavior programming, I mean, every, everything really. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other two years, we do uh, self-reports, um, and, 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 and we have applications that we fill out every year. So really heavily regulated. We have to have special education teachers, the same as public school. They have mm -hmm. to be certified. Um, all of our staff have to be um, a minimum of a bachelor's degree uh, if they're not um, teachers. Can you describe the types of students that EBC serves and sort of the state that they're in when they arrive at sure. your school? Since it's, I think people hear depression and anxiety and they think that while those are, you know, serious mental health issues that some students can handle that and still go to school, sure. but your students are sort of in a different phase. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, 
those are the diagnoses and how that manifests is, is behaviorally. So we have you know, kids that are externalizers. Most of our kids are externalizers. So they're engaging in behavior that um, is just not going to be um, appropriate in a public setting. Um, but the root of that behavior is that mental health um, challenge or struggle. Um, so they're doing things uh, such as, um, you know, eloping from the classroom, um, you know, ripping up and just you know, kind of destroying property um, all the way to even aggressive acts. Um, and then we have our internalizers, the kids that are, you know, not really going to school. They actually will not even arrive on campus. Um, we have kids that are shutting down completely um, and crying and sobbing um, for hours on end. So kind of have those two categories of students. Um, so when they um, are referred to us, you know, we, we know all these things about the students. But we also know that we have an array of services that are available that are really going to kind of tackle that root, which is that mental health challenge or struggle. Um, at EBC, we have um, every student receives a minimum of four um, therapies per week. So it's four hours of therapy that's carved into their school day four hours less academics, um, but often our kids aren't accessing academics when they come yeah. to us anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, so receiving you know, those therapies is really kind of the um, starting point to recovery yeah. and um, skill development for those kids. Yeah. And how do you um, set academic goals when there is priority on kind of stabilizing um, yeah. their emotions? And, yeah. yeah. Um, so we um, we actually talk really heavily about this with our with our families when um, they come in um, after that initial referral. Um, most of our families are um, really they know that there's um, a challenge, the emotional challenge, and that really does need to be the focus. Some of our families are really concerned about academics, and we kind of have to reframe that, reset yeah. that for them. Um, but that is the focus. We have to have kids feeling good. Mm -hmm. um, their emotional well-being is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and so we take that as our focus. And once kids are beginning to feel better, they are starting to access academics more and more. Mm -hmm. And um, they're in class more. They're feeling better about their performance. Um, and we're setting those goals um, in that kind of order. Mm -hmm. We know we need to tackle that mental health challenge first. It, that is you know, intertwined with how they're presenting behaviorally. Um, so the academic goals may be, um, um, you know, minimized a little bit so that we can tackle that emotional um, well-being and the behavioral output. And then we can start uh, kind of increasing the, um, the rigor of the academics over that time. Yeah. Are kids actually expected to graduate from high school, like maybe not at 18, but at some point? I mean, to have covered all the curriculum that the state requires. Yeah, yeah. so uh, as far in at ABC, and I only can speak for us, 99% um, um, of our kids are on the diploma track. So we have a few students every year that we need to do a certificate of completion for, um, but our goal is to have them return to public school as quickly as possible. So mm -hmm. we, we are an intervention program, not an alternative program, not intended for students to be with us for the entirety of their um, their education. We want them returning. Um, and we end in 10th grade for that purpose. Uh, we do not graduate kids from EBC school. We want them to go back into their communities to graduate um, in high, for high school. There are a lot of elements at EBC and also non other non-public schools I visited that felt really is like so specialized and so unique, you know, from like incredibly small class sizes, mm -hmm. sizes to just the specialized services that would be hard to provide at the same mm -hmm. level at traditional, you know, comprehensive schools. But are there aspects of the EBC program that you feel like could be realistically replicated at public schools? Um, obviously, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I um, have obviously been enmeshed in it for many years now. And I, I don't say it's easy, but I think the biggest factor, in my opinion, and we talk about this as a staff a lot, is that rapport building and that care that we take for kids. Um, it is not driven by academic pr production. It's driven by how kids are feeling and how kids are responding to us emotionally. And so we take and put a lot of effort into building that relationship and making sure that relationship is as positive as possible. Um, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in public school, but I think that there is limitations um, and, and time limitations, I should say, that um, teachers can spend doing that. 
um, because there, there isn't much more of an academic focus in that public school setting. Yeah, and especially if it's a, a one student in a large class or yeah. something like that, it makes it even more difficult for the teacher. Right, and you know, the, the ratios, obviously mm -hmm. you talked about class size and just um, the number of staff members that we do have available, That's a, that, that is a big difference. We can devote that time mm -hmm. to kids. Um, we have no more than 12 kids in any classroom and a minimum of three staff. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then many many classrooms, we actually do have more staff than, than three. So it just depends on the, the needs. We'll add staff where we need to add staff. So the Palo Alto School District is actually working to develop some new programs and services mm -hmm. to bring some non-public school students back. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you make of that, if you think that's a positive change or if you have any concerns. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, What's best for kids is to be in public school. I believe that strongly. Um, I often tell parents, um, you know, you, you are here on this interview at EBC, but you don't really want your kids to be here. I mean, you know, we, we want kids to be in public school. That's why our philosophy is to have them return as soon as possible. So, um, you know, we look at those referrals closely and we want to make sure that kids do need that level of service. Um, so we're always happy that, you know, public schools are putting more services in for kids. Um, financially, and on our business side of it, that you know we'll have to take, we'll have to consider that and take a look at that. Um, you know that means more, you know, kids leaving us, and there is a, you know, kind of a, a business aspect of that. But um, you know, kid, for for the students, we would love for them to be remaining in their their home schools. Yeah. Um, has uh, ped pedagogical um, uh, approaches have they changed uh, over the years, such that? either things are going differently at your school or some of that can actually be imported into the public school system, adaptive technology. Yeah, I mean, with, or, yeah tons of te technology uh, being developed. Um, you know, we're using, you know, every student has a Chromebook now. We're teaching, um, you know, we're not necessarily going away from writing, but writing is a huge trigger for most of our students. It's one of mm -hmm. the first things they tell us on the really? interview That's is that I, I, don't, I don't want to write. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that voice and hearing that voice yeah. of, of that student is really important. Um, so every student has a Chromebook at EBC. Um, we are teaching typing and, and you know, keyboarding really early. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we're going. We all send yeah. emails and we all <laughs> communicate uh, with, our, with our fingers, not necessarily through pen and paper anymore. So um, audiobooks, voice to text, um, those are really common in, at this point um, for kids at EBC. Um, Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, those there's there's so many more. Um, I can't recall right now, but there's just there's that development is absolutely you know continuing on. You know, every year there's just new things that we're adding. Yeah. Um, accommodations that yeah. we add into the IEP and making sure that kids are feeling very comfortable about how they're accessing the curriculum. Yeah, it certainly seems like that could be imported to when they go back to public. Yeah, school and it often is. Use... It, it, those are those are pretty common. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, you know. It, volume, uh, rigor of the academics and those types of things and having that flexibility um, is really, really important. And we, 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 uh, we change the, the volume of the academics almost immediately when kids come into us. We train, change the rigor. Mm -hmm. We start very you know, small mm -hmm. and very um, comfortable for the students and we just increase that expectation over time and, and that kind of recipe does work really well. Yeah. Have you seen school districts understanding of mental health um, and how mental illness can manifest sort of on the surface as behavioral issues. Have you seen that evolve over your years? Yeah, I mean, the, the districts are fantastic. I mean, every district that we work with, and we work with many, um, probably 60 diff different districts um, between our two campuses, um, most of them have dedicated uh, mental, mental health professionals um, as far as like even directors of, of the mental health program. And so um, I think you know, over time, as we're seeing more kids struggle with mental health challenges, the districts are devoting that um, those resources into those areas. Mm -hmm. um, our model is just a little bit different. Um, we have just more, um, more ther therapeutic intervention that's typically offered in a in a public school setting. Um, but I do think that they're doing a really great job of um, implementing those resources and, and providing those resources to kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've seen that shift, um, mm -hmm. in particularly in Palo Alto, sure. um, with wellness centers and just, uh, it seems like more of an awareness among you know educators and the community about mental health. Yeah, we're certainly talking a lot about that. I, obviously, I work at 
the Children's Health Council, so that is our, our yeah. primary focus, is um, working with ch uh, children that have, you know, struggles, just struggles all around. So, um, but there's been a big uh, increasing in uh, kids across our nation that are being diagnosed with mental health challenges. So, um, I certainly think this is a, um, this area in Palo Alto is rising to that occasion and really uh, focusing on providing the services that kids need. So, through a non-public school or through mm -hmm. a public school. Yeah. One thing that struck me about the interviews that you did with the families was just that uh, there's sort of a resistance to going outside of the, the neighborhood school, for one thing, and then, but also a frustration that it seems like they've tried every possible accommodation, every possible angle uh, to education before ending up mm -hmm. um, in non-public schools. And I'm kind of, I, I kind of want to, to pick your brain a little bit about what do you see um, of families and we're there, kind of the state that they're at when they get to you, and then yeah. what changes over time? Yeah. So um, the families, most of the, the families that we're meeting are um, kind of in a, in a desperate um, state of, just like you said, they've tried what they think, have tried everything that they know. The mm -hmm. districts have put in a lot of different resources, and those have been exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so they begin to look at, you know, kind of outside the district. And... Um, Lots of families, you know, do their own research and know about non-public schools, and some people, some families don't know know about them. So, they're coming to us with arms open and just saying, "Help us," and that is yeah. mostly, you know, kind of the uh, the state that they're in when they when they come to us, mm -hmm. and that really does foster a very collaborative relationship, which is really highly important for the success of our kids. Mm -hmm. um, one of the therapies that we require is a family therapy. So families are required to be on our campus um, for 60 minutes a week uh, for family therapy. Mm -hmm. That is a service that's embedded into their IEP. Um, so they're with us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, kind of helped me we, uh, we can't do this, we've, we've, we've tried everything that we know to, uh, to try, really does foster that collaboration with our staff. And um, those kids are really successful when we have kind of this big mm -hmm. family working together to keep, um, to, to implement these new skills and goals. Um, and they do it. Yeah, yeah and that's one of the things that I, I think uh, families are concerned about when they're leaving the neighborhood school is that they're lo lo losing community. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like some of that's created. Just yeah. in the collaboration that you have to foster in yeah. order to help the child. Yeah, we we talk about that a lot with families, and they do say that you know, um, my child is really struggling. Is going to really struggle because he's been at the school for his entire you know mm -hmm. elementary or, or middle school or whatnot. He has friends there, mm -hmm. um, and we just say you know that's just going to be on hold for a little bit. I mean, we can go back to that, and we really encourage you know um, parents keeping those friends. Um, those play dates, those interactions uh, going regardless of where the, ch the child is going to school. Mm -hmm. um, so we just kind of talk about putting that on hold, keep up the, the social aspect, the social activities that you have in place, um, and then they'll return to that because that is our, that's our goal. Yeah. There was one thing I just want to say about sort of the family mm -hmm. impact that I didn't, I wasn't able to get to in the story, but I think just the, the impact on the family unit. Um, one a uh, family that goes to EBC mm -hmm. who I spoke with, and I was talking with the mother about just the impact of how her child had transformed while at EBC. Um, and she said one of the biggest changes with, was that they were finally able to spend time with and focus on their daughter. Mm -hmm. And after wow. you know having spent so right. many years only focused on their son, and she you know was becoming emotional talking mm -hmm. about it, that made me really realize like, of course it's about fo you know supporting that child, but the sort of ripple effect of students right. who struggle in this way is really important as well. Yeah, yeah we, we um, try really hard to incorporate siblings mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. all those family therapy sessions if we can. Obviously, they're in school, um, but, you know, if there are issues that we need to really tackle, parents will make the opportunity for them to come. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there is this ripple effect, and um, it's touching all members of that family. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and I think the ripple effect of um, the success exists too, right? Just like, you um, and that parent is saying, um, so it, that I'm really happy to hear that that feedback and continue to you know support those families in that yeah. way. Yeah. One thing uh, that I think comes up is just the cost of uh, sending a child to public school. So it doesn't cost the family anything, correct? Nope. Okay. Um, are there public are there private schools that do the same thing as the public non-public schools in terms of, like 
therapeutic um, day schools? Th there, uh, uh, there are, um, mostly those are going to be kind of like um, residential treatment mm -hmm. or boarding type schools. Mm -hmm. um, we have a private component. We have, you know, we could have private parents that want to um, fund the tuition of oh. that student at ABC. We're not solely just a non-public school. It's I just see. the tuition okay. is really, you know, to to provide the services that we provide, it's, it is costly. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really difficult for a family to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, that's why that, it's so important we, that the public funding Right, the public funding it, yeah. is, is super important. I mean, you really couldn't provide the, the, um, the level of um, services and resources that we provide at a rate that a, that a, a typical family could really mm -hmm. afford. Yeah. yeah, and that same mother I spoke with also, I asked her if they had considered private school, and she said that while they could have afforded it, she felt like her son was in such a state and his behavioral issues were so extreme that he wouldn't have ever gotten into right. private school. That's exactly, yeah, there are many private schools, um, but sure. none with a focus, yeah. Not, yeah. none that I know of with a focus that's, you know, similar to what we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're and we have kids that, when they transition from us, go to go to private mm -hmm. school because they're actually able to do that at that point. So we have kids transition, you know, back to public school, private schools, back to other non-public schools, um, and charter schools. So kind of all the all the um, all, all the variety of, of those. Yeah. Um, any final questions here before we wrap I don't up? Think so. Okay. Yeah. And did we miss any important points about non-public schools or, or special ed in general? No, I, I mean, I think this was a, a great conversation. I think, um, you know, I think that uh, the biggest point that we have, you know, that I would want to express is just that that care um, and that devotion to that rapport and that kind of relationship building. I can't express that enough uh, mm -hmm. as far as the importance of that is, uh, of how important that is for kids in the development of their um, their educational program. Yeah, families aren't just sending a kid to you and yep. and and yep. hoping you'll take care of things, but it sounds like a very collaborative process. Absolutely. Well, Joni Miller, thank you so thank much you. for being here. Thank really you. Really appreciate thank it. You. I appreciate it. Uh, that wraps up this edition of Behind the Headlines. If you think there are other people who would like to know about this topic, uh, you can always share the link to this video. And we also have uh, Behind the Headlines as a podcast. To find that, go to paloaltoonline.com slash podcasts. So we'll see you next week.